Alright, so I've been... Hello, everyone. So I've been designing with uh, the Highwind or WPT and K linear rails. And I've looked a lot on YouTube and saw people just mounting things and I and just you know, drilling holes and tightening down. And there's a lot of ways to position these. And there's a lot of things to know about these rails before you just bolt on things. To kind of increase your dollar, like how much you get out of every dollar in terms of precision, and then there's also some weird things in terms of uh, uh, hole placement, just by the fact that sometimes not everything is divisible by 20 and, or 40 with a 60 spacing on their catalog. So if you can Google any sort of high win deal, um, this doesn't need to be playing right now. It's a really good song though. Oh well. Alright, well. Back to this. Alright, so. I'm gonna explain some basic things about the rails that I just learned, and so I could be wrong. Please correct me if I am. But, uh, static base load is the amount of um, pressure or force it can take. Sorry, not pressure force it can take before um, detenting the rail or the ball or roller for that matter to, if it's a roller um, one ten thousandth of the diameter of the ball so it's going to be 27.76 kilonewtons of force down, bearing down before you detent or before you um, deform the rail or the ball by one ten thousandth of the nominal diameter. Um, static momentum rating is if you were just with the, I'm pointing and I have a mouse, with the direction described, it's the amount of force before this, I believe it's one ten thousandth of deformation, the same thing I explained. So with the MY, it's hard to see, but that's a Y, is if you were just to take the rail and was bolted down and twist it, just twist it, just like this, it would take um, 0.2 kilonewton meters of force. Is that over a meter? It, it, either way. Before it uh, deforms. And then dynamic base load rating is The amount of force that can be applied, because I, there's some standard service rating for every rail you have or you order. I think, so I remember, I recall 40 kilometers. So after 40 kilometers, in order for 90% of the rail to still be intact or usable or serviceable to previous spec or factory specs or something like that, this is the amount of um, this is the amount of load that can be on. So. The static base load is like the max where you, you don't want to touch that because if you go past it, you're permanently deformed. Um, but if you operate in between the base dynamic load and the base static load, then your service life is going to be decreased. Uh, there's service hours, but the, I didn't know what any of this was until not too long ago, so I thought it would be useful to explain that to people. Then, in terms of hole diameter and hole rails, so say you have, it has right here listed that P, the spacing between the holes is 60 millimeters and E from the edge of the rail to the middle is 20 millimeters. So say you've got a 100 millimeter rail. See this. You can tell that, oh boy, this is different. All right, let's do this. So 20 plus 20 is 40. So 60 is 100 millimeters, all right? So this all, all the math adds up here. So 20, space 60, 20, hole. Oh, that would be a 100 millimeter rail. Now, say you had a 600 millimeter rail. When you divide up 60 nine times into 600, you have 30 left on each edge. 
and they don't do it they don't offset it to where it's 20 off one edge and then 40 on the other they split the difference so it would look like this so nine holes nine holes 60 place spaced apart and then there's 60 left over once they're evenly spaced so they split the difference of 30 and 30. Um, that's something you should ask your supplier about i initially almost got some parts made the wrong specs because i didn't look i didn't ask um luckily the salesman mentioned it to me thankfully uh because i just looked at the rails and assumed oh it's going to be 20 from one side and it'd be 40 on the other from the 600 example so it, it's all it always helps to ask on those sort of deals the next two things that i've learned a lot about is preloading and the importance of preloading these rails in order to get some actual rigid rigidity or the rigidity very uh, high rigidity out of the system because if you just have two things tightened down and they're flush they, they will slide like there's no if there's what there's some amount of force that can be applied to one of the planes to make it spin some amount so what you can do to get rid of that is preload them and there um, there's some cat in the catalogs of the of the guides which I, you should also go through. There's a lot of information about how how to preload or what amount or what force for what your application is. So for me, I'm making an epoxy granite mill. Hopefully I'll make many of them, but for now just one. And I am mounting them on rails and I need it to be rigid. rigid. I don't have the funding to order roller bearings in mass and one of the roller bearings were fairly expensive. So I did with the ball. I went with the ball bearings. Uh, these aren't the rails I'm going to be using. Actually, I'm going to be using the CC. Oh crap! I'm going to be using the CC ones. So this is the CC. Uh, but these are. This rail is the exact same, and that's kind of what I was um, looking for. So. Here's here's a rail. Grabcat is a lifesaver or a time saver. Uh, so here's the rail we're talking about. So here's my mounting, my my uh, insert for my epoxy granite mixture. One thing you'll notice is the holes right here, right here, 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 and then there's one under this. But I think if I move this, the whole rail will slide. They're for aligning. So when you there's not all of rails are like this, but generally on the lower end of the spectrum, there's only one reference edge, meaning that there is only one edge of this rail that is ground precisely. That if you were to push it flush up against something, it would uh, align. It would be. It would align the rails in a straight manner. So, one thing that you can do is press it up against something. There's a couple of installation videos on YouTube about this where there's a guy with a, like a ground reference edge and a gib and he ties it down and everything. Uh, I don't really have that luxury of machining so I kind of have to be cheap and I want to be able to do this fairly quickly for if I need to do five or six at a time. If it's a one of, you can do what most people do is take a dial indicator, tense, and then slide up, tap, slide up, tap, slide up, tap, tighten, slide up, tap, tighten, and get everything in line. But it's quicker, easier, and more, well, not more precise if you do it correctly, to use some sort of reference of to press, press it up again. So this could be a raised lip, like this, and then if this is the rail, it would press up against it like this, and then it, it along it just be aligned. But seeing as I'm using a, it's epoxy in it, so yeah. But seeing as I have to use a mold for this. I want these holes to press up against the mold so I can't have a protruding thing. I have to add something after. And so what I have is these are dowel pins. Uh, I use two different sizes because when I get things machined they're not going to be perfect so I'm going to, I gave myself six different holes of two different um, dowel pin sizes and I'll be able to mix and match to see what um, gets me closest and then I can do things by hand after. So that's the first method first thing of preloading you need to do or you not need to do but it will 
help you go get every dollar that you spend because these well, the carry it the rails are fairly inexpensive but the carriages are expensive they're you know ten to thirty dollars a piece depending on the quality and type that you get then the next type of preloading you need to do is for the carriage so turn this off turn this on so here's my lip for the carriage I haven't I don't have it shown here but what I'm gonna have it do is I'm gonna have a tapered I'm gonna have like a 90 degree thing a block piece of plastic probably Delrin the hole and an angle some screw that matches the angle and I'll just screw it down to push the block up against this rail and that preloads it and I can tighten that I can torque tighten it however I need to and that preload will will make it much less likely to move from its original position it takes at least that minimum amount of force for it to move from its original position if it's pressed up against something so those two types of thing those two things should be kept in mind when making your and designing your machine now they aren't necessary you don't have to do these things but they will increase the rigidity of your machine oh one more deal when I first made my very ghetto CNC machine that I think there are a couple of videos on um, when I made the rail so when I made the holes I made them the same size as the screws because I was like oh you the screws same size so holy oh, dude these rails the screw the holes under should be the same size as the mounting rail but the hole inside the mounting rail should be larger so you see how this uh, this diameter is slightly larger than this diameter that gives you room for alignment because it's like imagine if you like if you had this be the same size they would have to line exactly within like a tenth or less and to not have like r jar everything when you tighten things down so this gives you a little leeway room and this allows you to finally adjust things um, so yeah, that's probably not the quickest video, but a quick video of a few things I've learned machine, machine, a few things I've learned designing with just these rails. There's a lot of other things I learned and I can talk about from spindles to uh, castings to everything if people are interested. So yeah, thanks. Really good. Control the hidden sea when I go to the chase of the man.